Three lessons from our story tonight. Number one, there's a lesson about family. God designed the family. He made Adam, and the only thing that he saw in his creation that wasn't good was that Adam was by himself. He saw that it was not good for the man to be alone. He took a rib from Adam, but the rib made Eve. And, and he brought Adam and Eve, and he said, these two shall become one flesh. Now, we're fond of saying God did not make Adam and Steve. He made Adam and Eve. But I'd remind you, he didn't make Adam and Eve and Yvonne and Yvette. <laughs> one man, one woman, staying together for life, raising their children, teaching them the truth of God. God designed the family to perpetuate truth. You are part of a church family. God designed the church to perpetuate truth. You know, in, in the Bible, righteous people are compared to wheat. And unrighteous people are compared to weeds, tares. Now, y'all don't have real big yards here, I understand. But anybody have a garden, some kind of a garden, got a little garden, plot, all right? Uh, how many have ever had weeds in your garden? When did you plant them? <laughs> you never plant weeds. They come automatically, but you got to work hard to get the good stuff to grow. This church is one generation away from extinction. You got to keep reaching people. You got to keep planting seed. You got to keep pulling out weeds and planting wheat. And Judah was a part of a godly family. Now they had a lot of problems, but it was God's family. God said to Abraham, I'm going to bless you and make of you a great nation. Abraham had one son named Isaac. Isaac had twin boys, Jacob and Esau. Jacob was the son of promise. Jacob had 12 sons. And from that beginning, God said, I'll make a nation so numerous that you won't be able to count them. You'd have to be able to count the grains of sand on the seashore, the stars in the sky, if you wanted to count the family. If you couldn't count them, you couldn't count the Jews either. And we see in our story that there is a departure from the family. Judah left Jacob. He left Simeon and Levi and Issachar and Naphtali and Dan. Uh, he left uh, God's chosen people. Now, they were a rough bunch. I mean, they hated Joseph and they were willing to kill him and lie to their father about it. They wound up selling him to be a slave. They were a rough bunch. They had a lot of problems. Uh, they, they didn't seem to have a lot of family unity. A, a family reunion with Jacob and his boys was probably going to have more arguing than it was laughing. And Judah said, I'm out of here. Came to pass at that time, Judah went down from his brethren, turned into a certain Adolamite whose name was Hira, went to a pagan place, married a pagan woman, had pagan friends. Now, let me tell you something. You better have a really good reason before you leave a good place. I would, uh, I would tell our people. I would say, the Bible tells us continue in the things that you have learned. Uh, if you know God, how many of you, you accidentally joined this church? You didn't mean to, but you wound up a member. You didn't do that. You said, I think God wants me to be a member of the Heritage Baptist Church. Now, you better be just as sure God wants you to do something else if you do it as you were when you came here. I would say, you don't need a peace to stay, but you better have peace to leave. Uh, continue in the things that thou was learned. Just keep on doing what God last told you until he clearly tells you to do something else. Uh, by the way, some of you come here, but you're not yet Members, you haven't been baptized, you haven't joined the church. Man, you ought to take care of that right away. You say, well, I'm just taking my time. Well, if you want to obey the Bible, here's what happened. Uh, the same day, they, they were added unto them about 3,000 souls. You know what happened? They got saved, they got baptized, and they're added to the church all in one day. People used to criticize us because people would come and get saved, and we'd baptize them the same day they got saved. And... Uh, 
Sometimes they get baptized the next week and they thought we ought to go through classes and all that stuff before they got baptized. And I'd say, well, we are sometimes a little disobedient, a little unbiblical because somebody will get saved in soul winning on Thursday and we wait till Sunday to baptize. Book of Acts got baptized the same day. So if you've been here more than a day and you know that the Bible says you ought to obey him in baptism, baptism is identifying with the Lord Jesus Christ. Baptism is like a wedding ring. This ring on the middle finger of my left hand indicates that I am married. It's not a trick question. I don't ask trick questions. I'm a simple guy. So this ring indicates that I am married. So if I take the ring off, I now am no longer married. <laughs> Right? If I gave it to this young lady right here, what is your name? Anne Marie. Anne Marie? Anna Maria. If I gave it to Anna Maria, how old are you, Anna Maria? Ten. You're still single, right? <laughs> if I gave it to Anna Maria and she put it on her finger, would she be married? No. The ring doesn't make you married. Therefore, wedding rings are unimportant and irrelevant. Right? Huh. If I stopped wearing my wedding ring, my wife said, you're not wearing your ring. You got a rash or something? No, I just don't want to wear it anymore. Why not? <laughs> my wife thinks I am attractive. She's the only person in the entire world. <laughs> but she wants people to know that I belong to her, and I want people to know that I belong to her. And I want people to know that I belong to the Lord Jesus Christ. So as a very young man, I was baptized, buried in the likeness of his death, raised in the likeness of his resurrection to walk in newness of life. And I identified with the Lord Jesus from that time till now. I've been a member of an independent Bible-believing local New Testament Baptist church. Amen. Judah left the family. Less than my family, there was a departure, but then there was a decline. Everything happened after that was worse. Now, he may have had a valid concern about his family. Now, they were certainly imperfect. They certainly had their problems, but they were God's people, and that was God's place for him, and God had put him in that family. So what happens? Goes to a pagan land. No worship of the true God there. He marries an ungodly woman. They have three children, and the first two of them die. And then, the story we read about, accidentally having twin boys by his own daughter-in-law. Now, he intended to sin, but he didn't intend to commit the sin that he did. I have a family in our church, Wayne and Carol McDonald. Brother McDonald was a salesman for a medical company when he joined our church in 1976. And uh, now he owns that company and five or six others. He's a very successful businessman, godly man, good man. And their background was not like us. Their, uh, their children went to the prom when they joined our church and uh, did some things that I thought were unwise, but man, he's grown over the years. And, and there were a couple times his wife would be a little upset with me because she thought I was too strict. But you know what? A few years ago, she said something to me. She said, well, you know, it seems like the people who stay here do pretty well, and it seems like the people who leave here don't. It may be the will of God for you to leave. It may be the will of God for you to go off to Bible college, to become a pastor, to be a missionary. It may be the will of God for you to move. But, but by the way, don't you ever go somewhere just because you got a job offer. Supposing next Sunday your pastor stood up and he said, folks, I'm going to be leaving. There's another church. They've offered me double the salary. And I just feel I've got to take care of my family, so I'll be leaving. Don't you think of him? By the way, he's probably worth twice what you're paying him. Bible says the elders that rule well, uh, t say an amen if your pastor rules well. Amen. Should be God worthy of double honor. That's talking about money. It says don't muzzle the ox that treads out the corn. Uh, that means you, you ought to take the average salary of your deacons or of your church and double it. And that's what you ought to pay them. That's what the Bible says. 
Well, that'd be way too much money. Well, then you get to find out what he would do with the surplus. I'm sure he'd be wise with it. But you would not, you wouldn't say, well, pastor, we'll miss you, but we understand, you know, you got to take the money. You'd say, I thought you were a man of God. I thought your commitment was to obey God and to serve God. I thought that you were here because of the call of God. Now you're going to leave just for money. Did you know that your pastor may have more time to serve God than you do because he does it full time and you work another job? But did you know that it is just as much your responsibility to serve and obey God as it is your pastor's? And did you know it'd be just as wrong for you to bail because of money to say, well, I have my house worth $800,000 and I can buy a house uh, five times as big for half the money if I moved to Arkansas. You could, but you'd have to live in Arkansas. <laughs> I like Arkansas. It's a great state. <coughs> uh, everything got worse. When Judah left, a lesson about family, a lesson about focus. Judah goes to a harlot. And a few months later, three months, they say, hey, Judah, your daughter-in-law Tamar has played the harlot. And she's with child. And he said, bring her forth and let her be burnt. Now, that was the penalty at that time for adultery. It wasn't wrong that there'd be a penalty. I think he was a little harsh in what he chose to do, but, but, but that wasn't the problem. The problem was that what they were accusing Tamar of doing was exactly what Judah had done himself three months earlier. Do you know all of us are capable of great hypocrisy? And Judah's focus, he was heartless. He was, he was, he was uh, quick and cruel, but he wasn't only heartless, he was hypocritical. Judah's focus was on Tamar, it should have been on Judah. The Bible says, hey, why are you worrying about the moat, the little sliver that's in your brother's eye, and you haven't dealt with the beam that is in your eye? Thou hypocrite, first remove the beam from thine own eye, then thou shalt see clearly to remove the moat from thy brother's eye. The Bible makes the focus on us dealing with us. Consider thyself, lest thou likewise be tempted. Sanctify yourselves. Uh, cleanse yourselves, it says in Joshua 3 and verse 5. But you know what we're able to do? We're able to ignore great faults in our own lives and be really harsh on the faults of other people. And there's some people, they seem to like being able to find something wrong with somebody else and tell everybody about it. That's not Bible. That's not Christ-like. The Bible says God has no pleasure in the death of the wicked. They deserve it. And, and to be just, he must deal with them, but he doesn't like it. A lesson about focus. Anything bug you about this church? Well, let me ask you another question. Does anything about you bug this church? <laughs> yeah. I sometimes laugh out loud at my own stupidity, at my own uh, venality. Somebody says, the Lord speaks to you. The Lord speaks to me all the time. What's he say? He almost always says, well, let, you're an idiot. And he's always correct. I'll get, I'll find myself irritated about some little thing and, and then I'll realize how foolish, how ungodly, how unscriptural, how unchristlike I'm being and I'll laugh out loud. But most of us spend so little time considering ourselves. That's what the Lord's table is all about. Let a man examine himself. Well, it was not all about that, but that's the prerequisite before you remember the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. Wow. Judah's not a very nice guy. I, I don't think anybody's prayed, Lord, would you let my child be just like Judah? I don't think anybody's ever said, now I want you to read the story of Judah and I want you to grow up to be like Judah. Lesson about family, a lesson about focus, but there's a lesson about the future. If you open your Bible to Matthew chapter one, let's do that. Matthew chapter one. 
the book of the generation of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. Abraham begat Isaac, Isaac began Jacob, Jacob begat Judas and his brethren, and Judas begat Perez and Zerah of Tamar. And Perez begat Estram, and Estram begat Aram. And you don't go three verses in the New Testament until you find Judah and his offspring mentioned, not just as people who existed, but in the direct line of the Lord Jesus Christ. Wow. Here's the first lesson about the future. God works in mystery. We don't understand everything God's doing. We can understand some things, and we ought to. The Bible said he made known his ways unto Moses, Psalm 103, his acts unto the children of Israel, but you'll never understand everything. And, and God is doing things that you have no idea of, and sometimes the most terrible and awful things that happen in life, the most wonderful things will spring from Joseph being sold to be a slave. That was evil on the part of his brethren, but he said, you meant it for evil. God meant it for good. And he said, it wasn't you that sent me hither, but God. He said, God put me in that pit, and God put me at Potiphar's, and God put me in prison, and God put me in the palace. I don't like the pathway, but I love the destination. God works in mystery, but God works in mercy. Wow. Judah. Judah's not the first descendant of Jacob, he's the fourth. The, the line always goes through the eldest son, or almost always. There's got to be a good reason that it doesn't go through the eldest son, but it doesn't go through Simeon, and it doesn't go through Reuben. It goes all the way down to number four, to Judah. Now, I want you to understand just a couple things. God has good plans. Don't let your lack of understanding keep you from obeying him. You got upset about something in your family or in the church family or in some part of the work of God and you say, well, they're just my hypocrites. I don't want to be part of that anymore. But if you'd be honest about it, you got your own hypocrisies. Well, I'm going to do this and this, but I would never do that. I used to wonder sometimes I'd hear about a a well-used, seemingly great Christian who did something terrible. And I'd say, how could they do that? I found the answer. They do that the same way you and I do what we do. Well, oh, Brother Lett, I know my sins aren't anything like that. That's what I'm talking about. Always excusing ourselves while we judge somebody else. Instead of letting God deal with us, well, I, I never committed adultery. You know, it's an amazing thing. We always find somebody worse than ourselves to compare ourselves to, don't we? I'm not as bad as him. When my dad ran the rescue mission in Detroit, he said even on Skid Row, there was a, a, an artificial hierarchy. One guy would say, well, I, I may get drunk, but I don't beat my wife. And the other guy said, I, I may get drunk and I may beat my wife, but I don't cheat on her. Everybody find some drunk worse than them. Hey, you can always find people worse than you. But God didn't tell you to be better than somebody worse than you. God told you to be like him. He said, be holy for I am holy. But here's what really intrigues me about this story. Judah leaves, leads a terrible life, becomes the father of his grandchildren. Think about that. Has children by his daughter-in-law. So uh, he didn't mean to do that. You see, when you start sinning, you lose control of where you're going to end up. You cut the anchor that holds you. You cut the rope that holds you to the anchor of truth. You lose all control where the tides and the winds will blow the ship of your life. And you'll end up in some place you never ever would have gone. Somebody said, well, that sin always takes you further than you want to go. It keeps you longer than you want to stay. And it charges you a whole lot more than you intended to pay. So I want you to look to Genesis chapter 44. Joseph winds up 
in charge of the land of Egypt. There's a famine. Jacob sends his children, his sons down to buy bread. They don't recognize Joseph, but Joseph recognizes them. And he asks them, uh, do they have any other brothers? They got one other brother named Benjamin, Joseph's only full brother. All by the same father, four different mothers involved. Judah, Jacob was forced, tricked, deceived into marrying Leah, and then he got Rachel, and they each had handmaids, and he had children by both his wives and both their maidens. And Joseph says, Do you have any idea? Yeah, we got a brother named Benjamin. He said, well, if you, I don't believe you. I think you're spies. If you come back, you bring that brother with you. I won't sell you more food. And they come back. And Joseph sets up another test. He starts by giving Benjamin five times as much food as the rest of them. And then he says to his servants, you put my silver cup in the bag of grain that goes with Benjamin. And when they've got a good little bit down the road, he has the servants chase after them and say, hey, somebody stole my cup. And he brought it back. He said, I, I, can know, I know who did this. A man like I, I'm able to divine. I can figure this out. And he said, the one of you that has my cup in his sack is going to be my prisoner. But it was planted. And they opened up with a sack. And the cup was in Benjamin's sack. Now, the brothers were jealous of Joseph, because his father loved him best. Jacob was unwise to demonstrate favoritism. Now he loves Benjamin, the only son he has left, he thinks, by the woman he loved and wanted to marry. And they're going to put Benjamin in jail. I can imagine him a few years earlier, 22 years earlier, when Joseph, they say, well, good, now we're rid of both of them. Yeah, daddy's favorites are gone. He'll have to deal with us. But watch what happens. Verse 12, he searched the end of the eldest. Left to the youngest, the cup was found in Benjamin's sack when they rent their clothes and laid it every man his ass and returned to the city. And Judah and his brethren came to Joseph's house. Wait a minute. I thought Judah left. I thought he went down to Canaan. I thought he made friends with Hiram, the Adelamite. I thought he married a pagan woman and had pagan sons. He did. But somewhere in there, somewhere after these evil things had happened and Judah saw what a mess he had made of his own life, sometime, someplace, the Bible doesn't tell us how, but it tells us that it happened. Judah came back. Hey, I want you to know something. God loves you. His family loves you. His people love you. And no matter where you've gone or what you've done, there's always a way to come back. And I won't read the verses. But Judah speaks words, Matthew Henry says, no more beautiful words of filial piety, that is, love for a father, have ever been spoken than the words by Judah. And he says to Joseph, my father's old, and if you take Benjamin, you'll bring his gray hairs to the grave in sorrow. And he said, please take me and let Benjamin go. And from a group of men who've been willing to do anything to be read of the one favorite brother comes one who now says, let me be the substitute and save this other favorite brother so my father won't go to the grave in sorrow. Met a man in our church. Uh, he's still a member. He's in a, a facility now. He's Alzheimer's. School teacher. Very educated, cultured man. Got saved in one of our early services, probably about, oh, 1982 or three, something like that. Got involved in our church, and, and I think we inadvertently got him doing too many things, and he just couldn't keep up with it. And, and uh, rather than say, I can't do this, one day he just he wrote me a nice letter. He said, I'm leaving. He sent me $100. I began to think, well, if they all left, at least I'd have a good start to build another church somewhere else. And he's gone for 12 years. You know, he went to one church and another church and another church. 
didn't stay any place long. That's what happens when people leave our churches upset and out of the will of God. They don't they go very seldom. They go one place, settle it, and, and they hop around here and here and there and here. So you get in the habit of being critical. You'll be critical wherever you go. You'll find fault every place you are. He came to a wedding at our church, and our people were very sweet to him and kind to him. And he came back. He joined our church again. He was faithful. He was a regular soul winner. He'd sometimes run into students he had taught and win them to Christ, going out door to door. He became one of our good deacons, one of the most highly esteemed members of First Baptist Church of Bridgeport. And I'll never forget what he said to me after he'd been back a little bit. He said, you know what, Pastor? He said, I discovered that what I was looking for was what I had left. Yeah. There's always a way back. Whittier, the poet, has a poem called Maud Miller. Maud Miller on a summer's day in the meadow raking hay. It's a story poem. It tells the story of a fresh, beautiful farm girl working outdoors and a wealthy young lawyer from the city is taking a ride in the country on his horse and he stops and asks her for some water and she pulls out the bucket and gives him a dipper full of cool, clear, fresh well water. And as he stands there next to his horse and drinks the water, he thinks, you know, it'd be nice to marry a sweet, wholesome country girl like this. None of the pseudo-sophisticated, painted-up women of the city. And she looks at him and she thinks, wow, it'd be nice to marry a man of substance, a man of means, and not have to labor out in the field all the time. But neither of them spoke their thoughts to the other. And the girl married a root country squire and the man married a dowdy city girl. And Whittier ends the poem with these words, alas for maiden, alas for judge, for rich repiner and household drudge, God pity them both and pity us all who vainly the days of youth recall. For of all sad words of tongue or pen, the saddest are these, it might be have been. You can end your life with one or two phrases in your heart. You'll say, I'm glad I did, or I wish I had.